what kind of decline in the food production are we going to expect? If we're at the beginning of this, how much worse it's going to get throughout the next decade and a half? Sixty percent reduction globally. Sixty. Now there's many. Now there's many outcomes that could occur. Now believe me, there's right. many outcomes that could occur if we all get right. on board and start these conversations on governments how to respond to this. The current way we're doing it, they're looking at sixty percent reduction in all global agriculture when it hits the bottom of this thing right around twenty twenty eight to twenty twenty nine. All of this Biden inflation tax talk, what's it really about? And more importantly, what's the actual effect of inflation on the lives of real people? Joe Biden claims that it's indisputable that his jobs plan is working. This data unequivocally shows that it's not. Well, at least for American workers. Rather, inflation is surging. And more than wiping out any wage gains these workers might have experienced... And historically, when inflation spikes, commodities like gold, silver, lumber, and real estate surge. Learn how simple it is to add physical gold and silver to your portfolio ahead of the rise in inflation and predicted price rises. Patriot Gold Group has a no fee for life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver. And you may be eligible for the no fee for life IRA. Call one 800 Three five six four four seven zero, and get a free investor guide today. And with the knowledge that Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer from 2016 to present, click on the link in the description box below for more information. And now on with the video. I'm Jeff Nyquist. This is the JR Nyquist podcast, and with me is David Dubine. He is the guy that does the mini Ice Age conversations, global cooling, grand solar minimum, all things about this science, about the the changes in the weather and other things that are coming. And I, you know, I'm trained as a political science, David. Welcome to the show. Appreciate you having me on because what I see in the future of repeating cycles of solar activity that are going to reduce food production and crash the economy as disposable income is fed into the food monster and the food economy. A once in a 2000 year event. Yeah. Because, you know, I will, I will just add this in here. If you look at where the planets will be in their orbits, what we're going to see in October of 2024 is the exact same orbits that we saw in 79 AD. A lot of people in Nova Vesuvius, obviously, is the most famous volcanic eruption then. But if you have uh, any kind of software like Solar System Scope or JPL or some, there's a lot of free softwares out there that do uh, planetary geometry or where they where the planets sit in their orbits. I would highly, highly encourage you to go out to October 2024, and if the software is strong enough, reverse it back to 79 AD or right around that 2,000 year mark, and you'll see how they match up in a square. And there seems to be some extra electromagnetic effects where those four planets start to play in on themselves as everything, um, you know, as the sun declines in its activity, those four start to coalesce in their own magnetic field. And then the Earth's sandwiched in the middle there, and you have looping toroid waves on top of that. I mean, there's a lot of ifs out there, and we're about to live a lot of new. We're going to, science is going to go light years ahead on understanding our solar system, the sun the cycles and how different magnetic fields can form an inner loop on outer planets here in these next 10 years. We'll probably learn more about science with the instrumentation we have in these next 10 years than we did in the last 5,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're going to be going through something that's different. And you you mentioned the 7980. One thing that she, uh, Zarkova, explained was that the sun is, the Earth is closer to the sun in its orbit than in other times in history. And this is like uh, going to be the case for hundreds of years. Uh, so that might have some mitigating effect. But you had mentioned to me the other day, because of the al this alignment of planets, the northern hemisphere is closer to the sun during the summer now and further away from the sun during the winter. Could you talk about that for, uh, you know, is that a significant factor here? Well, it's a well-established science checking 
where uh, the geocentric orbits of the Earth are, and you can it moves out further away from the sun, and it's been mapped that NASA has charts on this. Right. Era of time, millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years, and trying to equate some of this and what we started talking about, the onset of the Ice Age. Like Theodore Landscheid did an enormous amount of work uh, trying to put this together with obliquity and all. And, you know, then they got the precession of the equinoxes and all these things mixed in on longer time frames in this 200 years of climate science. You know, going back half a million, two million years is a much better gauge of larger effect cycles that could affect things on our planet here in terms of climate than just right. yourself or myself driving a car to the to the the farm down that way right and 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 i've read that this is not one of the uh times in history where co2 is at its high point in the atmosphere now is it no it was at around seven thousand parts per million not too long ago and when i say that i mean relatively so not a lot of people want to talk about that either. That's another sort of hidden bit of history. When they show you these climate charts, what I don't like is most times when they show you these long-term climate charts, they'll always stop at around 9,000 years or maybe 10. They go, look, the last 10,000 years. And what they don't do is bring it back those extra 3,000 years to show you when the Earth's temperature plummeted 15 degrees Celsius, stayed there for 1,000 years, and then ran up 10 degrees Celsius in about less than a century so that's that era of history is called the younger driest period and when you go right around that era when you're looking at other forces and you know that the orbit of the earth is going to be pulling more toward the sun in the winter in the northern hemisphere in the summer and then as it pulls around it's going to be further out in its orbit in the winter I mean, you know there's going to be extremes just strictly based on that. That is a cycle that can be predicted that there would be extremes because of such differences in the heat and the cool coming in between that being that close to the sun on out and then coming back in. And it's doing more of an ellipsoid orbit versus a circular orbit, which you would expect. Right. Come by and then it'll get closer in. Now, the, the unknown, which is slightly known is that this extra magnetic field forming in the outer solar system in the interplay of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune is going to have some causation or some effect on this as well. Now, to be seen and which will be calculated and known as a fact after this event is how intense did that second magnetic field become? And what intensity did it have any effect on our planet as a add in to what the sun regularly does? Because you have to think about magnetism. It's not just a flat disc of, uh, you know, like on a, on a vinyl record player that just goes out like this. It loops in on itself. So we're only going to be one. We go Mar Mars and then Jupiter. So we're going to be just two planets away from that second magnetic field Taurus loop. But then we also have the sun, which we're always in. So then we'll have two of these looping toroids coming on top of our planet with the weakening magnetosphere. And right now this polar wander and the the changing in the magnetic field strength and uh, the polar wander where the north and south poles are moving around. Yeah. This is very strange. We haven't seen this in beyond what you're talking about, recorded history of verbal and uh, you know yeah. written record. This goes far back past that, 12,000 years plus ago. And then yeah. we're getting back into this time when the Earth's magnetic field is starting to jump around a lot like it did 12,000 years ago just yeah. prior to the... Uh, Younger Dryas event. Yeah, the uh, ancient Egyptians. You have uh, Plato's fra fra fragments from Plato, the philosopher. His his ancestor um, uh, Solon, the lawmaker in Athens, went to Egypt. He was very fascinated by the written records, and he was told things by the priests. They had like a legend about the chariot of the sun scorching the earth. And there was a discussion, a uh, fragmentary discussion, about uh, what sounded like giant electric storms striking the earth, and the people in the highlands were just devastated by it. You wanted to be in a lowland area, is what the priest said. As I remember, I got curious and I read about this. And there was a German scientist in the 1930s who was working on this saying, had a theory that there was a micronova event, that the sun something came off of the sun and it struck the earth and it did enormous damage to the earth. Um, do we know anything more about that now? Do you have any, um, any things you can share about what you've read and, and what you think on that? 
Well, the Micronova Research, the real person you're going to want to reach out to and check out the mini series. He, he does many parts of series, and the last one he did was going in through every single native, uh, even not well beyond Native American, but he went well across the planet on all indigenous peoples to find their legends and then equate it. And he put a spreadsheet out. Did they talk about darkness? Did they talk about planetary impact with objects? Did they talk about flood Did they with waves? Did they talk about high winds? And he put a whole spreadsheet out on every legend across all indigenous peoples with the effects of what you're talking about here across the entire planet to try to give it a date range. Like that's the research he does on these Micronova events every 12,000 years. His name is Douglas Vogt. And in my opinion, he's the premier researcher on Micronova from the Sun, and he anticipates another one in 2047. Now, based on what's happening currently, he's he thinks it's going to happen in 2047. That's that's interesting. That's coming up, and it's it's now we the Carrington event to explain. I can't for those confirm. I'm listening. just saying that that's his right. research, and I really believe he is the best on the planet. Right. And then right along with that, with the catastrophe series. Uh, suspicious observers and ben davidson over there they try to take a lot of graphics and overlay and and give you a visual representation of what these events might look like mm -hmm. when they're coming toward you and when the visual representation of what it would look like coming toward you and you look at all the canyon walls with what well, you know petroglyphs they right. look exactly the same um so there's you know, a lot of repeat in history on really the yeah. survivors that we talked about in the lowlands yeah. Witness that and then chiseled it on the wall so we would never forget as a warning. When you start to see, you know, Squatter Man is a famous one and they can replicate that in plasma laboratories now. But there's a lot of other imagery or shapes, creatures for a better word, that are now replicatable in a plasma laboratory that are on all the all the canyon walls. And we're starting to see several of these come to life again. And these electric sprites that I referred to in the tops of lightning storms that held state for another one or two seconds after a lightning discharge, those are on the wall too. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. things that are starting to show up. Uh, the auroral rope called Steve, this is a, a, it actually follows one of the magnetic field lines from the upper atmosphere down to Earth here, from the ionosphere down in. Now, it's, it's starting to glow where it's showing you the actual field line of the magnetic field line of the Earth is where it is, it's getting more highly charged enough to follow that. I mean, the magnetic field line's always there, but the plasma rope is following that. It's yeah, not, I should, the plasma uh, creates the field line, the field line's already there. For the sake of our viewers, I should explain, there's something called the Carrington event. In 1859, the sun had this burst, which would be like an EMP burst from the sun that fried telegraphs, melted metal, you know, destroyed telegraph wires, around the planet. I mean, we didn't have telephones, we didn't have all this electronic infrastructure, but we did have the telegraph. And ever since that event, the Earth's electromagnetic field has been gradually weakening, but that weakening has been accelerating lately. And the weakening of the electromagnetic field, we don't know quite what it means, but what this, what you're talking about is a theory that when that field weakens to a certain point, there are some very unique events that occur on the Earth. Visible in the sky everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, visible, visible in the sky. Visible in the sky everywhere. And that ties right into what you're, the polar wander, for a better term right now. Yeah, the, the North poles and South start polar to wander. Moving yeah, so the, quickly yeah. everywhere. That's yeah, exactly the, the, tied and the in electromag with that We're talking about the electromagnetic poles wandering, right? Not the, feel, not the physical... Right. Geo poles themselves, the physical poles. I mean, Charles Habgood talked about Earth's crustal displacement, where the actual Earth slid over on itself when um, the field strength on the sun went to, or our magnetic field went to zero. So I would have to think that somewhere else there was a zero point event. And then it slipped. And when the magnetic field started back up, it locked back in place. Now, that's something completely, completely different. I'm talking about a, like a physical pole shift on the planet. We're not talking about that. We're talking about north and south on your compass. But you got to think about how much life that would affect as it goes out of sync even more. Mm. And then our motors and the way that we, all of our devices run are built on the Earth's magnetic field aligned north to south. Well, what if that reverses or even changes 70% this way or, or whatnot? I mean, there's going to be effects to our physical infrastructure as well. 
Wow, that's something I had not ever even thought of that. That's amazing. Yeah, because when you're building something in a motor and it's electrical circuitry, it's it, what is it? It's you. It's using electrical circuitry based on north-south orientation, relatively. Mm-hmm. Not exactly down to the 360, you know, and zero where yeah, it is, right, but it, right. it works on that so, principle the way so we have these, a north and a south pole now. If that shifts, then everything stops working. You, you, so you have with all this, these changes in the Earth's electromagnetic field, the sun's electromagnetic field, we are going to something where there could be many, many effects on our civilization. And getting back to the food effect now, uh, you know, we're at the beginning of this thing, we think. Uh, you know, Zarkova believes it's going to be a 30-year cooling, and then it'll be warm again for a couple decades at least. Um, you, you, as you, from your research, this is everybody, all these scientists don't agree. Uh, Abdul Samatov thinks it's going to go much longer than that and potentially be much more serious. Um, what kind of decline in the food production are we going to expect, if we're at the beginning of this, how much worse it's going to get throughout the next decade and a half? Sixty percent reduction globally. Sixty. Now there's many. Now there's many outcomes that could occur. Now believe me, there's right. many outcomes that could occur if we all get right. on board and start these conversations on governments how to respond to this. The current way we're doing it, they're looking at 60% reduction in all global agriculture when it hits the bottom of this thing right around 2028, 2029. It may it may string out and pull out a little bit further to 2030. That's why I call my channel Adapt 2030 because we need to adapt our food growing strategies before 2030 to get through this event. Right, and and all these people are concerned about global warming when it's really global cooling they're like looking the wrong way when they're about to be hit by a bus. Well, the excuse is there to explain all the changes so people won't panic. And if you look at it in the way a continuity of government would work or you know, a top-down control structure, you're gonna wanna keep the people complacent or obeying and complying as long as you can. Because if everybody on the planet understands exactly like you and I do, it would be a very different planet tomorrow tomorrow or even tonight if the world came out and every newspaper on the front page has started to talk about what you and I are talking about now and it became the topic of conversation amongst all news and all water cooler conversation. The world would literally change in a matter of days because you would start to think very differently about the future, quote unquote. I mean, the fact is more carbon dioxide is good for growing things and a warmer climate at higher latitudes you can grow more food. So the, 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 the whole global warming scare that the oceans are going to rise up and drown us, the real problem is if we have cooling, we can't feed 8 billion people. And that's a political problem. Yeah, so you know, when you, if I say dinosaur times, the imagery that probably comes to you is erupting volcanoes, big, uh, you know, giant dinosaurs walking around, but then what's the size of the plant life? Mm-hmm. Those giant leaves that are th- that could cover an entire house. Well, that's what you get when you get high CO two concentrations. Yeah, you the get. Grow, and there's that's the well established science for any of you who might not believe that at all. Go to the strawberry industry and ask them what they do to get a high yield. They pump their greenhouses with 1,200 parts per million of CO two to get those plants to push out strawberries faster and at a higher yield, a larger plumpness and a more red color. Yeah, and CO2 is carbon dioxide. Right, but they pump the greenhouses full of that to get faster growth and and higher yield. Wow. Yeah, Yeah. that. see, and the whole thing, is it is plant food. And if you take a commercial level, and then that's kind of a hidden secret too, not a lot of wanted people talk about that, but just the way it is, it is plant food. I mean, we're just, it seems like we're just so incompetent at what we're doing here. I mean, to have the president, I, I cringe every time President Biden talks about global climate change and global warming. What are they going to do? I mean, am I mistaken, but that now we're having erratic weather that's hurting crops, floods, droughts. We're going to go into really serious cooling here in some winters, and the growing season is going to shorten noticeably. How are they going to explain it then? What are they going to say? Oh, we lied to you. We gaslit you. I mean, isn't there going to be a real accounting here when people already don't believe the government? I mean, isn't it going to get worse? And how fast is this going to get worse in terms of the cooling? In the blink of an eye on the cooling. uh, But I think 
they won't ever really, and this is my personal opinion, now you can agree or disagree with it, which is my mm. opinion, Right. that they will never come clean with this. They've gone too far down the rabbit hole with the narrative of CO2 creates everything. Now this is gonna bring you into these personal carbon allowances and how much you're gonna be able to consume based on when it turns cool, they're gonna blame the cooling on the warming. And they always do this. It's, you know, when they had record cold and summer snow, it was blamed on this uh, convection flow from that, uh, you know, swamp gas over there because of CO2 over there pushed that. So the record heat equaled the record cold. So you wouldn't have been the record cold without that CO2 making record heat, you know? And they, they spin this in the media and people are just too busy and too terrified living life right now. The unknowns are, you know, what is the fear index on the planet right now? People just biting their nails every minute they're awake to even try to get to the next second because it's so unknown. So they're not going to come out there and spend hours of research and questioning, well, you know, he said this about CO2 and it caused the record cold. And, you know, I'll just believe whatever the media is saying, the mainstream media, which is the corporate control side of it, which always you'll notice that always one thing I know if, the, if it's under control and not free media that's actually coming up with their own conclusions and doing some research and dropping a call to talk to somebody is when they always keep using the same words again. Like you'll watch a newscast or go through and read a bunch of articles in a day and they always have that same keyword in there every single time. It'll be right in that one or top two paragraphs. Existential threat, existential threat. Or mm -hmm. I just saw a new one. Adults are back in the room and I saw this whole collage of adults are back. There's somebody an adult in the White House. Who did so you'll start to see these same key phrases and if you do, you know they're running the exact same story with this exact same top-down approach, put this through the media, and get everybody on board using the same exact vocabulary. So once you see outlets that are using the exact vocabulary that it keep repeating and repeating, again, you know that that's a message, a narrative put out, not real news. When, if, they were, if they were saying they would be preparing society for this, but by not preparing, they're setting up a situation of mayhem basically and population collapse and then yeah. you know then it's kind of culpable we didn't know hands off it's not like you just said you know in the beginning when we were talking about was it anticipated as a purposeful call to reduce the population to have it step down lockstep with food production declines mm -hmm. okay yeah, that's, that's a, nefarious that's a, that's a plan yeah. you can point a finger they're on trial but with yeah. this, whole, this grand solar minimum not preparing people i'm sorry we had the science wrong not our fault. We're not culpable. It was it was nature. It was an act of God. Literally, it was the yeah. sun. But, and again, but, why? You know, going back in history, you studied so much of it. Why was every ancient culture so fascinated? And the sun was the focal point of belief oh, yeah. systems, rituals, holidays. The big, in why fact, when when Christianity emerged as the ruling religion of the Roman Empire, its com, com, chief competitor was sun worship. You know, Sol Invictus. It was sun worship, and the ancient Egyptians, you know, the the sun god. You know, they 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 associated Ra with the sun. So the sun was. I mean, the sun drives weather. It drives climate. It drives. You know, the idea that we puny human beings can affect the climate when the sun is like how many billions of Earths can fit inside the sun? It's so enormous. We cannot even begin to imagine this this body out there that's 90 million miles from the earth the radiation that it puts out and even when it hiccups or it burps we feel it you know it's just no doubt about it um and and so uh you know i i saw there's there's been books written about this uh saying that you know it's like a three to four billion uh people will not be able to be fed and and you're saying this is really a more conservative estimate. It could be 60% of our food growth lost, and we're we're just barely feeding everybody now. I think maybe the the last year and this year are the first years. Maybe there's not quite enough food, and they're going into stockpiles. Um, so when are we going to know how bad it's going to be? Is it going to be this winter? Is it going to be bad? Is it 2023, 2024? When are we going to start to see this? I mean, from your studying. How do you see it? 
Well, when the United States Department of Agriculture and CONAB in Brazil finally tell the truth and to, instead of trying to stabilize markets and we get real data and real numbers of what the carryover stocks were and how much garbage is still mixed in there with rotten black corn that they count as good yield that can be exported. Once they come clean with some real numbers, finally, then we could probably get a good idea of truly how much foods left that could be used and spread out through the lean times that are here. But if you're looking at it from just strictly that point of how much are we going to grow? We'll know at the end of this harvest season. Now, your food price is going to be right around double by the end of the year. It's going to be a talk around the Thanksgiving, or if you're in the United States, or Christmas holiday, New Year table, everywhere you go. Food prices are going to be an issue. And as we come into next year, the losses that have been incurred this year, the things are going to intensify. These same patterns that are locking in, they're going to start to lock in for longer durations of time. It's not going to be a one-year event because you mentioned China with the two years of floods. It would not surprise me if they had a third and then a fourth year of flood. Really? Now, in the exact same location, perhaps not. Maybe it would move a few hundred miles. But that cloud cell and that jet stream has locked into a new place, and they're competing for space, if you will. And that battle is going to take place in our atmosphere, and it's going to shift over hundreds of miles but the exact same square meter where it dropped last year and record flooded compared to that exact same square meter. But if you're looking on a, a regional or a world map, it's going to be in that, you know, in within that square of movement, there'll be other flooding events of yeah. same duration, same intensity. And well, it's beginning to happen. That's the whole point of, I firmly believe the COVID lockdowns and restrictions are leading to, again, your access to food, because as you see it being played out right now, mm -hmm. One of the key things that is now starting to rear its ugly head is your access to food is being limited. And now because there's going to be violence in these places, they're going to need to station troops and military and police at these same food distribution points. And then you'll, you're already seeing rationing across many places on the planet. You can only go out shopping one day a week for your food. What do you think people, what is that? That is not freedom in any way, shape, or form. That is rationing where you just lost six days of being able to have access to food. And what if you go buy, you want to go buy something and it's not there, the particular item you needed? Salt, sugar, flour, whatever it is, pumpkins. It just doesn't matter what the item is. You're allowed to shop one day a week in Australia. You're locked down in France. There's so many places you can or can't go. You can't get to the food and see this is what it's going to be all about. It's going to be about, are you a good or a bad citizen? And if you're a good citizen, you're going to have access to food. Food is going to be the most important thing that defines the next world that we're moving into. If there's not enough food, who determines who gets it? And those with militaries and police forces that can control the citizens are they going to be the ones who can enforce who gets it. Now, that's in some areas that have already set up such a top-down approach. And, you know, and again, it brings us back to 9-11 since that's today. Ever since 9-11, all has been built out as police state across the world. And, you know, it's like they're prepositioned assets, and they're here right now for this, this famine. Not yet. Food shortages, yes, now, but it will be more intense. And what happens when people do wake up? There's going to be a lot of angry people on the street, not just because your kids are hungry or my family's hungry. It's because you didn't warn us governments, and we had 20 years. And this global governance system we're moving to, where everything needs to be tracked, every monitor. And now they're going to, at least in the United States, IRS is going to be looking for every single transaction over $600 in real time from your bank to them. So uh, where was this giant step up that not, now they need to know where every dollar is moving across the planet? Is it to find out who's getting ready for these events? Is it because you're going to trade in an economy when you're going to be forced to only go through a certain outlet your mom and pop business is ruined, you know, across the United States. And I'm going to talk from the stateside perspective. There was a lot of food available and goods available in the mom and pop stores across. So if you didn't go to Costco or you didn't go to Sam's Club or Hold Foods or a corporate owned distribution point, you could still feed yourself easily. You could go out of the farmer's markets, which are closed now. You could have gone to uh, any kind of ethnic food stores across any, well, a lot of them are out of business now. You're not allowed to travel there. You can't go there. So where does that leave you? It leaves you directly funneled into corporate controlled food outlets, food distribution points. And you might say, well, David, I could just order online. And I'll say you're right back in the same point, place I just said you were, except you didn't physically walk there. You're ordering online. Like how many mom and pop businesses have point of sale, pay through portals where you can order, have something to deliver to the house. 
and you don't. And it's all about the food, the access to food, the control of the food for those who obey the most. And this is where I think it takes the kind of a darker turn. You know, you would know better than I through history how many times have we seen this same thing play out where food's used as a weapon to control the citizens. I mean, you have a far better gauge of that through history. Five times, ten times, a hundred times, I really don't know. I'm, I'm just, the Holmador is a, a pretty famous example of that. Holmador, yeah. The, uh, in, in the, under the Soviet Union, modern bureaucratic states, whether it's communist China or the Soviet Union, you had the famine in Ethiopia under the communists in the 1970s. You, you have... Um, uh, you you have this control of food is control of people. And what we're seeing now is very alarming because, as you say, um, there are controls being put on us now under the rubric of we have to do this for public health. And you, one wonders where it's going and what people know in higher places about this climate changing thing. There was one last thing I wanted to ask you about which intrigued me and you you mentioned it. Maybe we can do a show on it in the future. And it goes back to Professor Hapgood and to Einstein. This idea that there was a discovery made uh, more than half a century ago, more than 70 years ago. Uh, some kind of discovery that they understood some catastrophe that was impending uh, from what they learned and that they have kept it secret and that Hapgood and Einstein and others were working on it. Could you speak to that a little bit about whether this could be something that's known and what we do know about it? You can find the redacted version from the CIA and it's termed the Adam and Eve story. The and sign, not the word A-N-D, but the and. Uh, right. Adam and Eve story. And it talks about the previous cycle of when this happened, there were physical accounts of this, written accounts of the earth splitting open, how the wave transited all the way from the ocean clear into the center of the United States, how parts of ocean sank, and then other parts of the ocean just rose out of the ocean and other land masses just completely sunk underneath the waters, which would explainable if the earth either slowed its rotation or stopped the rotation or there was some sort of uh, nullification of a magnetic field where you know the earth might move slightly into a different place and i'm, I'm talking about full geophysical movement right. like hapgood was referencing to yeah and and Hap, hapgood's idea was like a washing machine that gets out of balance you know it starts to bounce and wobble and things start to happen we've all had that uh, a load in a washing machine and it's going round and the load isn't balanced and then the you'll see the actual washing machine will almost be hopping it'll actually move because of that imbalance so some kind of thing that and he he thought the earth's crust would become mobile at these times um, right, at least the top 300 miles, it would slide around the mantle. But again, you're talking about if that were to happen, there would have to be zero magnetic field on the planet for that to occur. Like oh. what we understand today, for the crust to to slide, it was almost as you know, I've heard it described so many ways. And uh, you know, it's like if you have an orange, and then if you were to be able to peel the orange from the inside and completely disconnect it from the orange, and then you know, the 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 skin of the orange would would slide around independently of the orange itself, and you could move mm -hmm. the skin into different positions. The only possible way that is going to happen on our Earth is if there is zero magnetic field, because those two, the mantle and further down and the crust, are locked in place because of electromagnetism. Now, if that electro or that magnetic field were to disappear, then both of those constituent parts would have no magnetic field to align to, and they'd just kind of wander wherever they wanted to until the magnetic field started again. And I don't know what strength they would have to attain. But they would lock back in place on position again because each of those parts would then have a magnetic field and it would adhere to the laws of physics and lock back in on itself. Now that is the only way that that's possible. And again, going back through myth and legend, there's so many accounts. Every culture, every continent talks about the Earth's rotation standing still, Earth's rotation reversing, uh, the planet spilling over on itself and giant tidal waves coming in, the earth rifting open. There's an enormous amount of stories of variants of this. Now, what's the real frequency? This is the thing that should be talked about and Douglas Vote really goes into. The frequency that the government, and I shouldn't say government, but the established science gives us along with uh, government permission is 
Once every 780,000 years, something like this. But what if the frequency was once every 12,000 years? And we're coming up upon another one of these events. See, again, when you're talking about controlling populace, catastrophism and repeating cycles is not the way to do it. Nobody will comply because they say, why? We know in seven years, we know in 20 years, this is going to happen. So why would I do that? Why would I plan for my retirement when I'm 65? If I'm 20 now, knowing a repeating cycle is going to do something to the planet in 30 years or 20 years. It makes no sense. Why would I even consider doing that? No, it's almost like throwing your money into Social Security now in the United States. You know the money's not going to be there in another five or six years. Why would you throw money in there and try to load it up so you could retire early? There's nothing going to be nothing left there. Right. So it's the same thing. How do you control a populace when you know there's going to be a lack of food? Government, or I should say economy, is not going to hold state. So here comes cryptocurrency because we need new valuations for what labor is, what value is. And governments are not going to stay together. A balkanization of the United States is the best hope at this point. I don't think it's going to be able to stay together through, I'm not saying now because of political ineptitude, but if the way it plays out with the, with the incredible food price rises and the regions of the United States that control food production mm -hmm. and others are reliant on those imports and exports interstate or even up into Canada and Mexico, let's say North America, there's going to be a lot of infighting of you have to give us that food across the the Kansas border or you have to give us that food across the the Georgia border uh, and you know there's going to be balkanization where regions will break off I do believe that's the only possible solution as we look at it politically right now but when we come into uh, the food production and the lack thereof and rising food prices Different regions of the U.S. are going to have a way higher valuation because they can produce food. They have the water. They have the factories. Hydro around here in Tennessee, everywhere. So if the southeast U.S. broke off on its own with the amount of hydroelectric and nuclear power plant resources here and the abundant water and the abundant food production and sea and both Mississippi River ports and sea ports, this could be its own country. But then you get further in, in different parts of the of the uh, United States. It's not like that at all. They're going to be stuck in a rock and a hard place. No food, no access to import export from any other country or intermodal U.S. They're just going to be relying on rail traffic and road traffic. And what happens if the crust does start to shift and break and, and rift apart? The infrastructure riding on top of the crust is going to also break. How long will it take you to repair oil pipelines, gas pipelines, water pipelines, electrical conduit, fiber optic cables, bridges, railroads, and highways, mm -hmm. locks, etc., to get the world to function the same way it does? See, I think government's preparing for a lot of breaking of infrastructure, too, based on the earthquakes and the earth cracks and rifts that are associated with the second magnetic field. And this time we're in right now, moving right now to 2022 and 2023. You are going to see more broken infrastructure that makes no sense. And they'll just, they'll just keep explaining it away, gaslighting you the entire way away. Oh, it was this. It was a frozen on thing here. And it, oh, CO2 made the ground freeze six miles under that caused uh, a, a rock to fracture. And when that fractured, it pinballed over there. And then it hit a gold vein that suddenly shot electricity out and it blew the highway out. And that was all because of CO2. It'll be something like this ridiculous, you know? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, David, thank you so much for this. We've done our hour, and I hope we can do it again soon. Um, your your wealth of information, and uh, I've always been very curious about this subject. So I thank you so much for coming on, and uh, let's stay in touch. And folks, um, why don't you talk about your websites and uh, your books and how people can get them? Okay. I also have a homestead here. I, I've decided to leave the city and move out to a farm. And since I'm telling you these things that I have spoken about with Jeff here in the last hour, I'm not going to say something to you like this and then still live in a city. I moved out to a farm in a remote rural East Tennessee to get away from this chaos and madness that I see coming. I'm trying to become self-sufficient as much as I can and get off the grid and grow our own food and have access to water and just so many other things. Homestead 2030, which is related right into that Patreon channel and the Adapt 2030 channel on YouTube, where I try to do updates on the farm mixed in with what's happening in the economy. And then, you know, some of these really strange and unusual weather events that back up what we've been talking about. 
out of season snows in summer, et cetera. So I try to loop everything in between. And then like this audio we've done here, I'll load that over onto the Mini Ice Age Conversations podcast on Libsyn. And any of you who listen to podcasts, you can find it anywhere podcasts are hosted. Uh, the website, oilseedcrops.org, there's a lot of information there. And I haven't much, I'm just, you know, I'm making a few choices in life here about updating things on social media or getting ready for the next batch of dehydrating and canning and going off and learning things on how to wild forage or spend the time of hours to load something back on social media. Personally, my own self now, I think spending five or six hours in the day to go learn how to wild forage in my acreage behind my house is way more important than updating an article on my website because the what we're transitioning through, I see a lot of things just, you got to get ready. So for me, growing the food and putting the feet in the soil and the fingers in the ground and things to get more ready, I'm trying to keep the social media presence, but those three things, the website, or not the website, but the Patreon account, uh, the YouTube channel and the podcast are the best way you're going to get it. Oh, in the book I wrote in 2019 called Climate Revolution, I would update it with more new information that has occurred since that time. Uh, but that's available out there. And, you know, I do an enormous amount of presentations and I leave most of that public. So, Jeff, I sent you that one that I did. I was just a primer on what is a grand solar minimum? How does it affect the Earth's magnetic fields? How tightly everything's linked? And then a few pages or chapters in history of how it affected which areas in the region and the world are going to get affected on maps I did in 2017 that seem to be coming to fruition. And, you know, and I encourage you to do your research, too. And the last thing I'll say, Jeff, thanks for having me on. Do your own research. I don't want you to believe a thing I said tonight. I really don't. Not for me to, you don't, I don't want you to believe me. I want you to go do your own research. And then if you find the research and you find this information, you'll be able to explain it to other people better. And then you can find your own next set of things that'll help you transition through this time. Now, not everybody's equal on this transition period. So what you find will be personal for you and your families. And I wish you the best of luck getting prepared. This is the last year that our society will stay intact in terms of economy and food pricing. So enjoy your holidays. And you know, it's helped me appreciate moments of being awake and alive more, knowing that these precious moments are here now versus having to fight for something in the future. And I'm trying to use my mind for manifesting here that we won't have any problems out here at all, that everything will just glide by us. Because keeping a positive mind frame and a positive thought process versus resonating in the fear, that's how they're going to trap you is in the fear. You need to get, I know it's difficult to say, there's a lot of things going on, but never be hopeless because people have lived through this for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It's not that we're just all going to disappear. Our way of life is going to shift, but humanity will still remain. So that's yeah. my message. Stay positive with it because think about transitioning through this. And if you can get off the systems that have held us down for so many thousands of years, and if things transition into more autonomy, uh, more self-sufficiency, your self-sufficiency and decentralized food starts at your own garden. That's what it's all about, too. And I think I'm going to ramble well over an hour. So I'll okay. let you go, Jeff. Thanks. All right. Thank you, David, very much. That's been fantastic. We're, we will do it again. That was David Dubai, and I'm Jeff Nyquist, and this is the Jeff Nyquist Podcast. So uh, thank you for joining us.